Welcome, my name is Nikki Lefebvre and I'm the Executive Director of the Natick Historical Society. We were established in 1870 and today we remain an independent nonprofit. Um, we really thrive on the support of community members uh, like so many of you. And so I want to extend my thanks uh, to, to our supporters for um, doing all you do to help make programs like these possible. And you know, thank you. Um, we're delighted tonight to have with us uh, Mickey Wolf, who who is the director of the Morris Institute Library. And I will formally introduce Mickey uh, in a moment. Um, but before I do that, I want to note that this program is part of our uh, Meet Our Neighbors series, um, which aims to really shine a light on local organizations that sort of have given shape to Natick both you know, in the past and in the present and also uh, long into the future. Um, and if you would like to see some of those Meet Our Neighbors episodes that we've done, um, you know, feel free to, to jump on our YouTube channel. Uh, we have um, a, a number of great episodes from your favorite uh, Natick organizations, from TCAN and Broadmoor um, to uh, the Bacon Free Library and um, the Natick Outdoor Store. Um, they're all up there so you can check them out and, and and learn about their histories and learn about what's going on with them uh, today. Um, you'll also find on our YouTube channel uh, a recording of uh, our recent program, Route 9, A Journey Through Time. Um, it was a really popular sort of um, maxed out program, uh, but the recording's available and you can check that out. Um, it's really a lot of fun. And that was a program we did in partnership with Historic Newton, uh, Wellesley Historical Society, and the Framingham History Center. Um, so I'm excited also to share the news that um, after many years of renovation and reorganization, organization. The Natick History Museum is reopening on Sunday, April 30th um, in the afternoon, one to four. And so we'd love for you to join us. We will have craft demonstrations, exhibits, maps to explore, um, and more. Um, in fact, you can actually join us for the whole weekend. We will be doing a number of programs, um, a Natick Center walking tour, a Walnut Hill walking tour, uh, a tour of uh, South Natick Center, and a talk about Natick during King Philip's War. So really it's a Natick history weekend, a time to get out and connect with your local history. Um, you can find out more about that on our website, natickhistoricalsociety.org and it's backslash Natick hyphen history hyphen weekend. Um, so don't miss out on, uh, on some of those fun events. Um, finally, just a couple of housekeeping notes for tonight's program. Mickey will talk for 20, 25 minutes and um, then we'll open it up for some conversation. Um, and I'll just note that if you have a question during the program, you should feel free to send it to me via the chat and I'll find a way to, to um, you know, let Mickey know what the question is, if it feels important to that particular moment. And otherwise I will um, incorporate it during, uh, during the conversation afterwards. And, you know, we're an intimate crew tonight. So uh, I think if you, if you want to ask a question live, you'd be more than welcome. Um, so um, make sure you check out uh, where the chat function is, as well as the, that raise hand function, which is under reactions uh, on your screen green. Um, so without further ado, I'm happy to uh, introduce Mickey. Uh, Mickey Wolf has been the director of the Morse Institute Library since July of 2021. And before coming to Natick, Mickey worked in small libraries in Sharon, uh, rural libraries like in Oak Bluffs, uh, and in large urban libraries, uh, such as in Gainesville, Florida. Um, and while she does love the opportunity to create change and help folks on the management side of things, her favorite job at the library is planning community events that focus on arts and sustainability, like the recent craft stop, which was a lot of fun, by the way, and the upcoming greeting card swap. Uh, when she's not working, Mickey plays in a, uh, a local softball league, and she also loves to cross stitch. Uh, so Mickey, we're delighted to have you join us here tonight. And uh, we'll offer you a, a warm but silent Zoom round of applause and uh, turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Oh, well, thank you so much for having me here tonight. I'm going to share my screen if um, everybody can see that. Are we good? And there goes my camera. <laughs> so I'm going to stop my camera. Um, so um, I'm Mickey Wolf. I'm the director here at the Morris Institute Library. I'm really delighted to be here at the uh, Meet Your Neighbors program. 
Um, I'm delighted to share a little bit about the Morris Institute Library, um, about our history in Natick. Um, and we're celebrating 150 years of service to the community this year. So this is a great time. And also um, our future through the vision of the library. So the Morris Institute Library was dedicated in 1873, having two staff members, uh, one librarian, one assistant, and a small number of materials. The featured speaker at the dedication was Henry Wilson, at the time what, who was the vice president of the United States under Ulysses S. Grant. Um, he was also a native resident. There was a modest collection of books on the shelves, um, and there were no library patrons, uh, no library programs for patrons to be had. So today, the library has 54 staff members, full and part-time, with over 405,560 print and non-print materials available to all Natick residents. And thanks to the library's membership in the Minuteman Consortium, Natick residents borrowed 452,566 library items in last fiscal year. And to educate and entertain residents, Library staff increased program offerings and served up nearly 14,000 um, programs to patrons in that fiscal year. But um, as we're celebrating 150 years of service to the Native community, um, I wanted to take a moment to discuss kind of a little bit more of a complete history of the Morse Institute Library. So it began in 1808 as a small collection of books inside the private home of Samuel Morse. The early circulating library eventually evolved into the Citizens Library, and by 1852, it had 425 books to loan to Natick citizens. And then in 1857, the town provided funds for a book collection as well as a librarian to keep it all organized. In 1862, the will of Marianne Morse created the Morse Institute Library, and the town institution was established. Marianne Morris was the granddaughter of Samuel Morris, was only 30, and she was only 37 years old when she died, leaving the entirety of her estate to the town of Natick to establish the library. Or, in her words, she had a strong and abiding interest in the welfare and prosperity of my beloved town. So what you see here is a picture of one of the very few items of Marianne Morris that the library still has. It's a sampler stitched by her when she was just 11 years old, and I've got to tell you, as someone who uh, cross stitches, this is a work of many, many long hours as an 11 year old. Silk threads on linen make for an absolutely gorgeous um, result, but it is incredibly painstaking to complete. So she did such a good job at such a young age. And also as an aside, um, please mark your calendars for Friday, June 16th of this year. We'll be having a birthday party for Marianne Morse. And also a discussion on this sampler and other Natick samplers, which the Natick Historical Society is kindly loaning to us um, for this occasion. It should be a really interesting lecture, plus we're going to have cake. So uh, back to the library now. The will of Mary Ann Morris gave the town of Natick the money to build a library and fill it full of books, but the library didn't actually come into existence until 11 years later. The first hurdle to the new library was financial in nature. There simply wasn't enough money in the estate to complete her bequest. And so it was on to on, it was on the in the hands of the five-member governing board to increase the funds. The second challenge was political, unfortunately. The town of Natick officially accepted the bequest of Marianne Morris in 1863, but then tried to avoid that acceptance in 1864. The case went all the way to the Massachusetts Supreme Court and was decided in favor of the Morse Institute Library Board of Trustees, and the town was required to support the library. And so on December 25th, 1873, the library was dedicated, and on January 1st, 1874, it opened to the public. But less than two weeks later, all of downtown Natick burned to the ground. Luckily, the library had been mostly built with slate and brick and sustained minimal damage. So as you can see here, in 1874, there was a 10 cent fine for each week you kept a book out past its due date. So today, in the interest of equity, the Morse Institute Library no longer charges a fine for late books. In 1874, the library was originally open nine hours a week. Today, the art library is open 60 plus hours a week. In 1874, there were three days each month, only three days when, a books, when books could be returned. Today, the library offers returns every day, including curbside book drops for convenience. 
And also for convenience, we have book lockers for patrons who want to place holds online and have the books ready for pickup in the outside lockers whenever they choose. And um, last but not least, I want to point out that in 1874, library cards were required. Um, today, we request that patrons have their library cards, but it can be the physical card or it can be your, court, your card stored in your Minuteman app on your phone. We also accept ID if you've forgotten your card. So um, getting back to the history of the little history of the library, the town of Natick absolutely loved this library and the library collection kept growing to meet circulation demands. There were additions to the library built in 1927 and in 1964, but by the mid 1980s, it was clear the library needed more room than was currently available. The library was not only a place for the folks of Natick to check out books, but it was also a community space for folks to meet, to study, to congregate and to share ideas. At Natick's 1994 Spring Town Meeting, voters overwhelmingly decided to support the new library by providing $7.4 million towards the renovation of historical building and a new addition. The current building incorporates the original building along with tripling the available space. So I wanna take a quick break from the timeline of the library here uh, to highlight a huge milestone for the Morse Institute Library, uh, which is the founding of the Friends of the Morse Institute Library in July of 1990. The Friends of the Morse Institute Library was established as an independent nonprofit organization to support the library. This volunteer group of absolutely amazing people continues to, to throughout this present day. They volunteer their time to support the library by raising funds for such ongoing projects as museum passes, the speed read collection, and they also support the majority of programs that occur here at the library. Their friends have also contributed to larger projects such as the refurbishment of the historic stained glass windows and antique furnishings at the library and the curbside book drop boxes and self checkout stations. Over the uninterrupted life of the Friends, they have raised over $750,000 for the Morse Institute Library. And we appreciate our Friends, every single one of them. And also, I'm going to just throw a quick plug here for the next Friends book sale, uh, which is happening on May 20th and 21st of this year. Please mark your calendars for this event as well. So the renovations to the old building preserved the library's place in Natick's history, when, while the new addition provided the foundation and space to take the library into the future. The space available to the Natick community was tripled, and there were meeting rooms for public use, an entire floor dedicated to children's services, and room for teens as well. Plus, there was space for collections to grow and opportunities for technology to be added, as more and more folks were in need of help with ever-advancing technology changes happening. And a crucial part of the, the library's mission to this day is to help bridge the digital divide and the new facility allowed for this just, just this to happen. So keeping pace with technology is a major part of the library's mission, but so is preserving the past and making it accessible to the public. In 2004, a gift to the library allowed for the construction of an archives room, which provides a secure temperature and humidity controlled environment to preserve the library's special collections. So in addition to the library collections, the library also curates the Veterans Oral History Project with generous support from both Representative Slinsky and Senator Spelka's offices in the Massachusetts Capitol. The Veterans Oral History Project collects, records, and preserves the stories of veterans over the last century. To date, we have more than 300 histories of our veterans recorded on DVD and available to borrow. The Legacy of Service Collection is maintained by our Information Services Department and contains photos of the men and women who served from the American Civil War through today, all with a Native community collection. And as a side note, if you'd like to see your loved one added to this collection, please send me an email after this presentation, and I'm happy to connect you with the right folks. So following the expansion, uh, use of the library nearly tripled in the following decade. Natick citizens demonstrated that when there is space, whether for meeting rooms, a children's floor study rooms or collection space, they would use it. The library became a popular place for Natick residents to meet, to study, to host meetings, to telework, and to attend library events and programs. And the library bookmobile continued a long tradition of expanding access to library services by visiting neighborhoods, senior housing, assisted living facilities, nursing homes, Natick labs, and community events bringing the Morse Institute Library to folks who might not be able to visit the physical building. 
Unfortunately, in 2020, the library had to shut its doors to the public, like many places across the country, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And the bookmobile made its final trip on Natick roads as its years of service were ended due to the age of the vehicle. However, being closed to the public didn't mean that the library staff stopped working on ways to connect with the community. Library staff hosted programs and events nearly every day and wrote cards and notes to Natick residents to reach out and say hello. Natick was one of the first Massachusetts libraries to re Massachusetts communities to reopen its public library with a checkout window operating from the original old historic building. And a new bookmobile was designed and is ordered with support from the friends um, of Morris Institute Library. And bookmobile still continue, um, services still continue to operate in the meantime. Uh, we just have a van right now instead of the bookmobile. So kind of looking ahead, um, Today, the library looks towards a robust and diverse collection of materials, including an ever-expanding digital collection, print items, and our new library of things. And seriously, the digital collection, it keeps growing at an absolutely exponential rate. The demand for e-books and e-audio just grows. Um, then that being said, though, our print circulation of library materials has also remained steady. In early summer of 2023, we look forward to welcoming our new book bike to the library. So please be on the lookout for it on the streets and the parks this summer. It should be a lot of fun. And in 2024, fingers crossed, thank you supply chain, uh, we will be thrilled to dedicate our new bookmobile fresh from the factory and ready to serve the 37,006 native residents of Natick. And this is just a quick glance at the 150th commemorative keepsakes we have, which are um, more details about those can be found at the library circulation desk. It's been a wonderful year so far as we've spent three months now celebrating our sesquicentennial. We have um, th these keepsake ornaments in celebration of the event and a robust series of 150th theme events planned throughout the year. And if you didn't make it to our mini golf after dark events in early March, you missed a rollicking good time with, by mini golfing throughout the stacks. And we work with local artists to get a collection of limited edition library cards available for folks to choose from. And if you haven't had a chance to upgrade your card yet, I highly recommend doing so and carrying some local art in your wallet or on your keychain. So I talked a bit about public libraries and the community, and I wanna delve a, a bit deeper in that for, us, for just a sec. So public libraries have always existed as a third space for their communities. The third space is part of a social theory where social environments of home are the first place, the workplace and school are the second space, and places like libraries are the third space where folks can seek out conversations and find comfort in being connected. So other examples of third spaces uh, would be places like churches, bars, coffee shops, and uh, beauty salons. So open third spaces, though, are rapidly disappearing in American life. And by that, I mean the places there where you don't have to be a member or purchase a product or service in order to belong. The public library is one of the last free public spaces in the US where folks can just come in and just be as long as they follow some basic rules, of course. And since the pandemic began, libraries have been moving those thriving free and open third spaces online, as well as maintaining, the, maintaining these spaces in the real world. So, at the Morse Institute Library, the mission of every single staff member is to inspire minds, enrich lives, enable learning, and foster community connections. We do so by hosting a variety of programs from piano concerts to Bigfoot discussions. We do so by offering computer classes and STEM programming. We do so by hosting access to databases to help local businesses grow and thrive. And we do so by offering a variety of spaces to the public for reservations. We welcome folks into the library and we welcome robust conversations about access, collections, equity, and inclusivity. So in September of 2022, the library hosted the Freedom is Reading wall on the front lawn of the library. Throughout the month of September, folks were invited to contribute titles of the books that they celebrate reading and they wanted to share with others. We kept track of these titles and we'll be releasing them with an updated Freedom Wall this September 2023. And I have to say, community, the community was absolutely incredibly generous with sharing their titles. The goal here was to remind the Native community of the importance of preserving the fundamental constitutional right to read. And I was able to have quite a few conversations with folks on these topics. 
Were they all pleasant to begin with? Nope, not all of them. But did everyone walk away from these conversations with a better understanding of the mission of the public library and particularly the Morse Institute li Library? Absolutely, yes. So wherever the library goes in the future, it will be well served by the Morse Institute Library Board of Trustees. This five member board was established by the will of Marianne Morse and continues through the present day with elections happening next week, in fact. There have only been 43 people to serve on this five member board across the 150 years of the library's history. The longest serving trustee was Henry Mulligan who served for 48 years. Henry Pruneray served for 41 years and Horace Gale for 40 years. And our very own Dr. Joseph Keith served for 34 years with his final meeting being just this month. Our library trustees know how valuable they are to the community and they help to chart a course for the public library here in Native. One other thing I wanted to point out here in the 150 years of the Morris Institute Library serving the Native community, I am only the 13th director. That's pretty amazing. And it's a testament to all of those who stayed to make this library such a wonderful place to work. And I will say this library is a wonderful place to work because of the trustees, because of the supportive community, and most importantly, because of the staff. The staff here at the library know their community. They know their patrons and they work hard to deliver the services that are their patrons want and need. So looking ahead for library programs, um, I mentioned that June 16th is Marianne Morse's birthday. Well, we're having a birthday party for her in the evening, um, as I mentioned, uh, but that morning we're also having another celebration. We will be unveiling the new peace banners that have hung outside the library each summer since 2020. And it will also be a thank you to the volunteers who helped to take the old peace banners and upcycle them into bags and pouches. Sustainability is a big part of everything we do here at the library, um, and this piece of peace event will definitely be quite the celebration. Um, and I also really quickly here want to give a shout out to uh, Morris Institute Library, Pam Lathwood, who you can see in the lower left hand corner here. Uh, Pam works at the library and she's the creator of the peace banners for 2020 and 2023. She's inc an incredibly talented craftswoman, but she also volunteered her time uh, to help make the bags. Um, so just a quick shout out to Pam here. And we're also this year, we're having a reception to uh, celebrate local artists who designed our limited edition library cards. Um, we're having this in May. So if you're around the area on Saturday, May 13th at two o'clock, and you wanna drop in to celebrate some super talented folks, uh, we'll be partying it up in the more sure of that day. Should be a great time. I also mentioned cookbooks a little bit earlier. Um, well, as a part of our 150th celebration, we're going to issue a new Morse Institute Library cookbook and we'll be asking for recipe submissions from the Native community. So if you have a banana bread recipe to share, and I think we all might have one of those after 2020's banana bread craze, or any other type of recipe that you are proud of, uh, please be on the lookout for a calls to action later on in the spring. The cookbook you're looking at here is from the last library cookbook issued in 1989. There are a lot of great recipes from names that we recognize through here, and we cannot wait to publish the updated version. And so I wanted to end this talk with some fun library trivia. I mean, I think library statistics are fun, so I just wanted to share with you. Uh, on this slide, you can see all of our collections here at the library. But did you know the average book circulation in the children's department saves a Natick resident $20.58? Or that the top two holes at the Morse Library currently are Lessons in Chemistry by Bonnie Garmus and Spare by Prince Harry? So I can say confidently that our patrons are good stewards of the collection. 88% of all of the books checked out of our library are returned at least one day early, if not more, with 2% of books being returned exactly on their due date, and 3% of books be being returned two to seven days late. This pattern, by the way, holds true for all library materials. It's not just one collection. But talking about books that are returned late, This Time Tomorrow by Emma Straub, The Light We Carry by Michelle Obama, the Boys from Biloxi by John Grisham, Mad Honey by Jody Picot, and The Hotel Nantucket by Ellen Hilderim are the five most consistently overdue books at the library this month. And yeah, we do keep track of that. 
And in terms of sustainability, uh, the library belongs to the Baker and Taylor Sustainable Shelves Program, which means that we sent back 1,078 books to the company, and these were books that the friends couldn't use. Um, these books were both resold and recycled and generated a modest three-figure sum for the library, which goes right back to the collection. And so I just wanted to end this by saying thank you for, to everyone who listened to, has listened to me talk about libraries for the past few minutes. We are inspired by the devotion our patrons show to us through the consistent circulation of materials and through program attendance. And we look forward to celebrating our milestone 150th year by continuing to offer a variety of materials and services to the community of need. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mickey. Um, I don't know if, yeah, there we go. That was wonderful. And I just, after hearing you talk so much about the Morris, I'm so grateful to be connected to this community with such an incredible library. Um, it's so fun to hear, um, hear about all of it. Um, so thank you for your conversation. And um, I want to invite everybody to, um, to send your questions to me via the chat. And I have a few uh, that have come in already. And you are also, anyone is also welcome to, um, you know, use the raise hand function and let me know if you'd like to ask a question uh, live. Um, so, um, so some love here coming in uh, for uh, the art exhibits that are, are uh, circulating and um, and also um, let's see uh, uh, a note about um, genealogy class that was offered during the pandemic and and what a wonderful help that was um, to so many people who were looking to sort of do that kind of work um, during the pandemic. Um, um, a great example of kind of how the Morris continued to serve um, despite its closed doors. And um, so a couple of questions here. I think one, you know, starting from the beginning, um, I, a question about um, the original 1873 collection. Do any of those books remain at the Morris Institute Library? Are there any legacy books that date back to that first collection? Um, I would say not to my knowledge, the books that have been identified as such, um, but that would be something I can also ask our archivist about, um, our librarian who takes care of our archives, um, just to double check, but I don't believe we have any, the thing about um, public library books um, in, uh, is that they're meant to be loved and often well loved and folks love them until they fall apart. Um, so <laughs> if we did have uh, one or two that survived, I would be very, very impressed. Um, but I can find that out. But it, as far as I know, no, no books, no books survive. Okay. Um, oh, that's one. I guess it's the sign of a good book, right? That it doesn't last <laughs> too long. Um, so I think maybe a, a somewhat related question, as you mentioned, archivists, um, does, does the Morse have a local history collection? And you talk a lot about the, the veterans oral history project and the, the veterans photos. Um, does the, does the Morse, uh, is it creating or how does it create access to its archival materials? Um, so that's a very good question and something we're working on now. Um, we both do have a local history collection that's available on the second floor of the library. There is some kind of out on the floor, there's some in locked cases, but we have a wealth of material that is um, downstairs um, that is being carefully preserved um, in the archives room but that also doesn't do the community much good because uh, they can't access it. So what we're doing is um, we're going through it. We're working with um, the uh, digital Commonwealth um, to try to digitize some of these materials, the materials that really can't be on the floor or the materials that are um, just uh, not easily accessible and to see if we can digitize them and at least make the, uh, make them available online to folks. Um, we have done that with the um, yearbooks. We're working on, um, we got a grant a couple of years ago. And so a lot of the um, Natick newspapers are online. Some are available online from home. Some due to some copyright issues are available only within the library. Um, but we are working on that. Um, we have a couple of uh, librarians who are going through, and uh, right now, um, going through the postcard collection. I think is uh, their their um, their their task right now. They're they're sorting through um, boxes, rows and rows of postcards of Natick over the years, which is pretty fascinating. Um, and they're posting them on Facebook as they find some really cute ones. 
Oh, that's wonderful. And I have to say, you know, Asha, from the perspective of the, of the historical society where lots of people come to us and they're doing research about their homes, their families, and their, you know, their memories of Natick, uh, the digital newspapers database uh, through the Morris, you know, we're referring people to that all the time, using it all the time. It's been game changing really for the kinds of stories that we can help people tell and also that we can tell ourselves about the community's history. So we could not be more thrilled uh, that the Morse did that. So um, thank you uh, for making all of those newspapers accessible. Um, it's wonderful. Um, I have another question here about um, authors. It, it, you are having uh, quite a few more, many more author-based programs than you've had in the past. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and how, you know, sort of why that is, how it works? Um, so uh, there is, we are now part for the, or are part for the next couple of years of the Library Speakers Consortium. Um, what it is, is it is a, a number of public libraries across the country have gathered together and we've all kind of combined to be able to, to get some of the, um, I'll just say high value authors um, that are no public library could afford by themselves. Um, and so what we do is um, we host, it's usually two to three authors a month. If you, if you look on our website, um, there is a link. Um, it shall tell you the two or three upcoming um, programs, but also there's links to the recorded uh, presentations. These are all handled by, um, uh, the, the an outside uh, kind of source who um, handles the conversations. Um, they're offered at different times, which is actually pretty helpful. So some are offered at like six o'clock, but some, because some libraries on the West Coast are participating, some are offered at like nine o'clock at night. Um, they're, uh, they started off primarily with fiction, with some nonfiction. They're listening when we're saying we want more variety and we want more diversity in the authors. Um, and they're really making, making an effort to kind of book those authors. A couple of really popular ones lately were um, Simon Winchester and Geraldine Brooks, um, who uh, folks really enjoyed um, tuning in. Um, so that's one way we're kind of leveraging the, um, the, the, the programming uh, money budget that we have to kind of um, work with other libraries um, and really kind of bring in some really interesting talks. Um, I know that uh, I have really enjoyed uh, listening to, to some of them. They're, they're well done. They're, um, the interviewers uh, have good questions, which is always, always crucial <laughs> when you're talking to authors, um, getting them to respond so that they don't hear that same question all the time. Um, and then uh, like tonight, um, we actually have someone downstairs. He's um, a local-ish author. His name is Paul Carici. He is a retired Massachusetts um, uh, police officer um, who both worked on the marathon um, uh, team for many years, um, helping to kind of plan the event and then ran the marathon. Um, and then he retired and he wrote a book and he's actually speaking um, right now downstairs um, at the <laughs> library. Uh, so that he's a, it, it's a fascinating talk. I've seen him once before. Um, so we're making an effort just to kind of bring in a variety of programs uh, for folks in the community. If you are interested in stuff, uh, I always say, please send us an email and we'll do our best to kind of find a, either try to find authors on a topic or specific authors as well. Oh, that's wonderful. That's so exciting um, and nice to see the, you know, different libraries sort of coming together to create a sort of a next level access. Um, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, I didn't mean I, to. I, I was just going to say that um, when I'm working on Oak Bluffs, um, sometimes you had access to authors you didn't necessarily have otherwise, just if they happened to be there. And so we got some great authors at a good, at, at really at, at amazing, um, um, amazing fees, let's just say. Um, but there are other times where I was talking to a couple of authors and their fees, and reasonably so, $25,000 um, for a single talk. Um, and that is how they make their money. I 100% expect that. Um, and I 100% will tell you no single public library could be able to achieve that <laughs> on their own. Right, so, right. Uh, yeah. so uh, bringing a bunch of libraries together um, and kind of lever leveraging all of that together, is a, it, it's working out well for us. So now is that sounds like a more recent sort of, um, you know, as we've all embraced, embraced kind of um, the technology of Zoom and other Zoom-like platforms, right? That there's a way in which that kind of technology makes that access possible. Five years ago, it would have seemed um, maybe pie in the sky or not as manageable. I Is mm -hmm. that part of the shift as well? 
I would say so. I'd say about five years ago, I remember having to try to work with authors to Skype because it was Skype five years ago. Yeah. Um, and it just, it did not, it did not work as well, let's just say, yeah. because so many folks weren't familiar um, with, with right. uh, how to engage with the technology. Um, right. And so we were able sometimes to get good authors or have good Q and A's, but uh, the technology sometimes also defeated us. So it's definitely, this is a, um, a positive uh, kind of um, uh, evolution um, of our, of our uh, Zoom experience. Yeah, yeah, it's exciting. Um, and so on that note, I, I have a question here about, can you talk about community partnerships that you're excited about, um, maybe in, in Natick, um, you know, different kind of partnership than with other libraries, but um, are there community partnerships within the community, within sort of local Natick um, that you're excited about? Um, sure. So um, I'll just talk about one, one of the most obvious ones, which is our partnership with the Bacon Free Library. Um, the other public library in town, um, we really enjoy uh, working with the uh, Bacon Free Library to just kind of offer more services to the community of Natick. I'm going to then say the Natick Historical Society because we have the event coming up in June. Um, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, so exciting. Very, very, it's going to be so much fun. I know I kind of geek out about like the history of textiles, but I think <laughs> it is going to be absolutely fascinating to hear um, hear her analyses of the, the samplers we have. Um, yes. And I really, um, I would just talk about some stuff recently. We're partnering with Natick 180 on um, book displays and kind of informational materials um, for uh, National Drug Awareness Week, um, which is this week. Um, and then we work with the Natick Public Schools. Um, so starting here, I started the Natick Library Networks, which is just um, an informal way of um, allowing the school librarians um, at all of the schools um, easier access to, to library materials here. Um, they can place hold. Library staff here will facilitate the placing of holds. Some of the stuff only we can do on the back end. Like if you need 10 books for a classroom, you can't do that on your own or your computer. You'll be clicking buttons all day. Um, so you can cut. They have a facilitator every um, every librarian at a school is paired with a specific staff member so they can just pick up the phone and say like hi Dale I need some books and the books are made available we then deliver them to the schools um, because we also recognize that sometimes when you're a, when you're an educator getting here is not the easiest thing um, so we just kind of do that as well get the books to the books to the school so I'm um, really excited about that partnership it just again just really um, it takes what we have the resources here in the community and just continues to share them. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, that's really cool. And, um, you know, while we're thinking about sort of the community and, um, I, you know, how how is the library responding to the sort of, you know, growing and increasingly diverse interests in, uh, in Natick and the communities it serves? Um, so one of the things we are undertaking um, slowly but surely is a DEI audit of the entire collection, um, and that's a diversity, equity, inclusion audit. What that does is it just looks at the books we have, um, and you're physically actually touching the books, looking through the books, and kind of figuring out what the books are, um, where, where the collection is, and where do we want it to go, um, and just making sure that we have books um, and other library materials um, available for folks that we meet their um, educational and recreational interests wherever they are. Um, it's kind of paying really close attention to the authors um, who are uh, suddenly hit high demand. Um, sometimes you can tell, like, you know, when Ellen Helderman publishes a book, you know to order two to three copies because she's going to be on the bestseller list for a while. But sometimes there are authors that surprise you. Um, and so to make sure that we're being responsive to there so we can get books to um, folks in the community as quickly as possible. And we're also, we're paying attention um, to make sure and being responsive as well. Yeah. And does that, so does the, the DEI audit or thinking, does that sort of also include programs or how do, how do programs and collections work together to support those kinds of goals? In a perfect world, <laughs> like, <laughs> what, what we would do is for every program, we would pair it up with in our collections um, and kind of then and essentially um, it's, it's in retail terms, it's cross marketing that we would kind of pair that up. 
Um, do we get to do that every single time here at the library with staffing? Not so much, um, but we do definitely try to highlight. Um, so the children's department does a fantastic job if they're theming the story time to um, have books kind of on that topic. Um, we're working, uh, we just started actually speaking of partnerships with Project ABC, which is a grant funded program from the YMCA. Um, they will, they're meeting down, uh, they're using our Leibowitz meeting hall um, every Wednesday at 10 o'clock. Um, it's registered, the folks have to register kind of with their site, but they, um, they come here and so they tell us the theme ahead of time and we pull out a collection of books and make sure to have them available for the families. Um, one of their, the um, primary goals of Project ABC is to uh, work with uh, families in literacy. Um, so the libraries and we're a perfect match. Um, so it's just really finding all of those opportunities to kind of remind folks, um, hi, we're the library. Um, we're awesome. We love to like just kind of give free stuff to people. Um, so just reminding people um, wherever uh, wherever we can. Um, I'm trying to make it a point to show up in as many, um, have library the library show up at as many places as possible. We're appearing at school functions. We, um, we're going to try to take that book bike all over the place this summer. You'll see us, one of the staff members pedaling around. It's an e-bike, so it'll be easy. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Yeah. Somebody was thinking it had books, books weigh a little bit, don't they? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I, the interest interest in pedaling the bike increased dramatically when I explained it would be an e <laughs> um, But it's going to be essentially a, um, if you, it looks sort of like a hot dog stand, but it pops out um, into a complete little library. So we'll be able to check out books to folks. We'll be able to register folks for library cards. Um, we'll be able to help folks out with some basic informational needs, kind of, and just meeting people where they are um, in the community. Uh, we're definitely going to plan, plan to take it out on the rail trail. That'll be fun. <laughs> oh, that'll be so fun. I love that. And uh, don't forget to check out those signs there on the history of the rail trail, um, Natick Historical Society <laughs> signs. Uh, and um, so another question here, and um, uh, about volunteer opportunities that um, uh we have a commenter who read that they'd been suspended for the moment, um, but any idea when they might open up again? So currently right now we're planning for, and I'm knocking on wood when I say this, a fall 2023 kind of revamp and re-roll out of the volunteer opportunities at the library. Um, they were suspended um, during the, the, the ongoing pandemic um, when the library reopened. We just kind of had to take stock of where we were, um, how the changing roles of library staff um, have kind of evolved, and then where do we need kind of that help? Um, so the plan right now is, um, secondly, summer is a really busy time at the library. Um, so it's one of those, we're just gonna do it in the fall. Um, plan to roll it out. We've got National Library Card Sign Up Month that month as well, but September should be a, we're thinking is a good month to restart the volunteers. Wonderful. Okay, so we'll all sort of keep our eyes on the announcements uh, for that. And um, just a quick note, a couple questions about the Library of Things. Do you, can you say anything about uh, about that? Absolutely. We have complete, thank you for her, to whoever said that, by the way, um, <laughs> who asked the questions, because um, we have completely revamped our Library of Things. Um, it grew from a uh, somewhat a small collection um, over the, the, the past five years to we now have over 330 different items you can check out at the library. So if you wanted to host a, uh, a party on your lawn, uh, you can check out uh, giant lawn games like um, Jenga um, and Connect Four. You could uh -huh. check out an outdoor uh, movie screen and a mini projector to show movies. Um, and you could check out speakers. Um, it's just, we have so many things now. Um, it's really fun. Matter of fact, today I just, um, and we're adding more all the time. Today I just um, completed an order. We're gonna have community cleanup kits um, available for checkout for Earth Day. Um, so you can come to the library, you can check out a kit um, that's gonna have the little grabbers. It'll have bags, it'll have some safety vests. Um, for folks who want to kind of do something on their community on or around Earth Day. Um, so it's just oh, as folks, yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun. As folks suggest stuff, we're, um, we've got American Girl dolls too, which are really fun. Um, they, they're one of our most popular items right now. We've got six of them um, and they're circulating uh, pretty continuously. <laughs> Oh, that's so wonderful. Um, and, and Mickey, one final question, which is that, is there anything that you've learned about uh, Natick and its residents that has surprised you, um, uh, delighted you, uh, excited you? 
Um, I first off, I'm just going to say that the, the community of Munich is incredibly supportive of their public libraries, and um, that's just it, it was not surprising, but it's just really gratifying um, to know that the library has such strong support and such strong usage and need it. And I will say the other thing. Um, not surprising, but unusual is the fact that Natick has two public two public libraries, um, and that just goes to show how how much um, Natick loves loves his public libraries. It's unusual, but it's fantastic, um, and we love kind of partnering with one another to kind of just work on services to deliver the best possible um, programs and collections to the community. That's wonderful and a lovely note to conclude uh, our conversation this evening. Thank you so much, Mickey, for your, your time, your expertise, your thoughtfulness, and your commitment to bringing just excellent library services to Natick. Uh, I think on behalf of everyone who, who benefits from that, we appreciate you and uh, appreciate learning a bit about the history uh, of the library tonight too. So um, with, a, with a warm but silent Zoom round of applause, please accept um, all of our gratitude. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for having me here tonight. It was a joy to, to talk, to get to talk about libraries for a bit uh, to someone other than my staff. So thank you so much. <laughs> Well, thank you. Uh, and for those of you who enjoyed this, you know, the recording will be posted soon and we encourage you to share it so that um, that uh, more of us can learn about all that the Morse Institute Library has to offer. Um, and thanks to all of you who were here tonight um, and uh, have a good evening all around. Thanks, everybody.